Toledo's enduring romance with the Valentine Theater began in 1893, when a local business executive commissioned the design and construction of a theater as a tribute to his late father. After its grand opening on Christmas night, 1895, Toledoans embraced the Valentine as a place to laugh, cry, dream, and create lifetime memories. Over the next 85 years, the world transformed in many ways, but the Valentine Theater stood as a testament to the golden era of Toledo. Sadly, time eventually took its toll on the Valentine, and the doors closed in 1976 under the pressure of rising heating and maintenance costs and the trend toward suburban expansion. Enter the Friends of the Valentine and the Toledo Cultural Arts Center. Rather than lose one of the last connections to downtown Toledo's Gilded Age, these two groups banded together to convince the state of Ohio, Lucas County, the city of Toledo, and private supporters to finance the rehabilitation of the historic landmark. After 21 years of lobbying and an investment of more than $28 million, the historic Valentine Theater reemerged for its encore. Since the gala reopening in 1999, over 1 million people have attended 1,200 international, national, and local presentations and events. The theater has been used by more than 50 community groups, including the Toledo Opera, Toledo Ballet, Ballet Theater of Toledo, the Toledo Symphony, Toledo Jazz Orchestra, Masterworks Chorale, University of Toledo, and many others. The story of the birth and reawakening of this wonderful community treasure is truly inspiring. Join us now as we explore the tale behind Toledo's cultural gem in Encore, the story of the Valentine Theater. Encore, the story of the Valentine Theater is made possible by the generous support of Key Bank, supporting its communities through charitable sponsorships to arts, civic, education, and health and human services groups. Also through the support of Block Communications Incorporated and by the following, Ronald and Diane Bell Jr. Finley Davies Incorporated, Alan and Suzanne Libby, Mark and Gretchen Zindorf, and by viewers like you. Thank you. To fully appreciate the history of the Valentine Theater, our story must begin with the remarkable account of Valentine H. Ketchum, the theater's namesake. Valentine Ketchum was the son of a New York farmer who learned his trade of carpentry and ventured west in 1836, setting up a small store on St. Clair Street. Ketchum's timing for his move west was perfect. He arrived in Northwest Ohio just as the small villages of Vistula and Port Lawrence had merged together to form Toledo in order to take advantage of the Miami Erie Canal and the booming westward expansion of the United States. His business steadily grew and by 1841, he'd relocated to a better location on Summit Street. Valentine was associated in business with John Burdan, whose father was the first mayor of Toledo, and he married Burdan's sister, Rachel. In 1851, he pursued the banking business, and after some mergers and name changes, his bank emerged as the first national bank in 1863, which today we know as Fifth Third Bank. Like many businessmen of his day, Valentine speculated in land, and soon his real estate interests paralleled those of the Scott family. The Ketchums controlled large tracts of land, which is now downtown, as well as hundreds of acres of land west of Toledo. Years later, parts of Ketchum land would become Ottawa Park, the basis for the Bancroft campus of the University of Toledo, and the original plats of Ottawa Hills. Valentine was said to have been the first millionaire in Toledo. It's unclear exactly when he achieved millionaire status, but some evidence points to the Civil War years, as the Mississippi shipping systems were closed and the Great Lakes area experienced a lift in commerce. When Valentine Ketchum died in 1887, he left each of his children and his wife millionaires. A million dollars was a tremendous amount of money at that time. In fact, it's about 28 million in today's dollars. Valentine Ketchum's son, George, took full advantage of his father's advice and financial support to develop his own business interests. He was 24 years old when he inherited his father's fortune. He went on to become the treasurer of Toledo Chandelier Company and a board member at Seamless Handle Company and Toledo and Western Railroad. 
He had a seat on the Produce Exchange, was director of the First National Bank, and was elected to three terms on city council. While George Ketchum had many business interests, he may be best remembered for his hobbies. He raised thoroughbred racehorses at his country estate in the area we know today as Trilby. Early in the century, his horse Crescius won the triple crown of harness racing. In the 1880s, he owned the local professional baseball team, the Toledo Maumees, also known as the Black Pirates, and built a ballpark for them off Cherry Street named Sperenza Park after his racing schooner. Another hobby George Ketchum was soon to acquire was acting as a theatrical impresario, in which he brought the top carriage trade performances of the day to his chain of theaters, including a beautiful venue he would build in Toledo and name after his father. After um, the Civil War, um, the, the Toledo grew because the southern ports were closed. So Toledo's com commercial district grew because it was a shipping port. So that attracted industry. And then beginning in the 1880s, there was a concerted effort by Toledo City Fathers to promote the city as a place where industries should come. By the 1890s, Toledo had begun to change from a regional center of shipping and trade into a manufacturing center. The city's upper class was growing as fortunes were being made in wholesaling, oil refining, bicycles, wagon making, glass, and machinery. Once you started to have those successful industries that produced this booming middle class. So you had places like the Old West End with these big elegant homes where industrialists could show off their newly acquired wealth. And of course these people would also want entertainment because um, they had money, they wanted to be with others who had money, they wanted to be entertained. So um, theater was a big part of the cultural scene at that time. The Wheeler Opera House, which had been serving in that capacity as the place where national theater acts would come, burned to the ground in 1893. So this newly found middle class didn't really have a place to go. Um, so there was this sort of concerted effort of some rich, wealthy men in Toledo to build a new theater, one that would be bigger, more beautiful, um, and, and fireproof. The race was on among the city's leading capitalists to glorify themselves by building a new opera house. Wheat King, Sheldon C. Reynolds, was the first to announce his intention to build a theater. A few months later, Coffee King, Alvin M. Woolson, picked out a site and hired architects for his opera palace at St. Clair and Jackson Streets. But curiously, when George Ketchum, a man young enough to be the grandson of either Reynolds or Woolson, announced that he planned to build an opera house at the corner of St. Clair and Adams, the older men gracefully bowed out. Perhaps the fact that Ketchum's inheritance from his father allowed him to build the theater on his own, while Reynolds and Woolson had arranged syndicates to finance their ventures, had some effect on their decision. Besides, Ketchum already had a head start, as the site he had chosen adjoined, and was partly surrounded, by the commercial building he had begun erecting the year before. Before the Civil War era, the commercial heart of Toledo was to the south on the middle grounds, around the area where the Oliver House still stands. The St. Clair Adams neighborhood was residential and lightly developed. He was not one who rested on the wealth of his father. And even as a young man, he was extremely involved in the community. I think when Ketchum decided to build the Valentine, one of his reasons for doing so was to provide a place where Toledo could consolidate its city offices. There was no city hall, and the offices were scattered throughout the business district. Ketchum, of course, had served on city council. His grandfather was the first mayor of Toledo. And so Ketchum was very aware of the situation with the city offices. So he did provide space here, and the building was built specifically for use as a city hall, as well as housing the theater. 
The land upon which the Valentine Theater is built may have been the site of the first Ketchum family homestead. There is a legend that Valentine won the deed to the property in a card game in Monroe, Michigan, and that he cleared the land himself. An individual owed him $125 for groceries that he had bought on credit. And this individual had a carriage that was painted bright red and gold. And Ketchum ended up taking that carriage in payment for the $125 that the man owed him. Well, shortly after that, he drove the carriage up into Michigan and in Monroe, Michigan, and got involved in a poker game. Well, instead of betting money, they ended up betting these Wildcat securities. Basically, they considered them pieces of paper that were worthless. A couple of men from Monroe told Ketchum that if he would give them the carriage and the two horses, they would allow him to take all of the papers that were laying on the floor if he wanted to do that. By the late 1840s, he had made more than $200,000 selling these securities, and he still had not sold all of them. Befitting a memorial to such an esteemed father and to his own social ambitions, George Ketchum was bold in the construction of his theater. He hired the city's most famous architect, Edward O. Fallis, the designer of the courthouses in Noble, Lenaway, and Paulding counties, who seemed to have been given a very free hand. Fallis's designs included an unusual cantilevered balcony based on Adler and Sullivan's landmark Auditorium Theater in Chicago, built in 1889. This was the first successful use of cantilever construction for a large balcony. A cantilevered balcony requires no columns to support its rim and therefore eliminates blocked sight lines from seats beneath it. Fallis's floor plan broke with the common design of theaters of its day by arranging the theater's seats in straight rows rather than semicircular ones that accommodated more seats but gave some theater goers obstructed lines of sight. To attract the highest quality entertainers, the theater was fitted with 18 elegant dressing rooms, each unusually supplied with hot water baths. And in an age when electric lights were still considered a luxury, the building was equipped with large dynamos in the basement that lit 2,500 incandescent lights. Though Fallis and Ketchum were very bold in the structural design of the theater, they were far more conventional in decoration. Befitting the Victorian era, the theater was awash in marble, velvet, and silk. A variety of Italianate sculptures and urns dotted the halls, as did custom-made furniture in the French Empire, Colonial, and Dutch styles. On either side of the proscenium were bas-relief cupids piercing a heart with the theater's signature V in its center. In the end, George Ketchum's dream cost somewhere around $300,000 which amounted to $8.5 million in today's money. The Valentine Theater opened on Christmas night, 1895. According to William Speck's book, Toledo, A History in Architecture, the crowd was so large that its architect refused to allow his family to sit under his pioneering cantilever balcony. He sat under the balcony on his own, like a captain ready to go down with the ship should anything happen. The night was one to remember. The demand for tickets was so great that they were auctioned off. Mr. Fred J. Reynolds bought the first box for the princely sum of $250, two-thirds of the annual income of the workers who cleaned the building. The first night's curtain went up on a production of Rip Van Winkle, starring the veteran actor Joseph Jefferson. When George H. Ketchum arose from his box in the New Valentine Theater last night, in response to repeated calls from the House and modestly gave credit for the new theater to Toledo workmen and Toledo artisans, it was a fitting climax to two years of unremitting toil on the part of that gentleman for the purpose of giving this city a theater of which its people might well be proud. At this moment, the site was one for gods and men. The theater, rapturously beautiful in itself, was filled with the flower of Toledo. The harmonies of color of the amphitheater were only heightened by the many beautiful costumes of the ladies, sobered by the evening dress of the gentlemen. 
Over the whole scene, an exquisite pale white light was thrown, enhancing the beauty of the house and lending added charm to the loveliness of the ladies present. Fleetle Blade, Thursday evening, December 26, 1895. During that time, Toledo was uh, uh, a pretty wealthy, small city, so people were interested in the market. It was uh, partly the, the period that was the high point in live performance in American theater, so they were available. And then he started taking over other theaters. When you booked into the Valentine Company run by George Ketchum, you also booked into the other theaters. The Valentine Theater was the lead theater of the Valentine Company, George Ketchum's theatrical impresario operation. The Valentine Company controlled theaters in Columbus, the Southern, Indianapolis, English's Opera House, Dayton, Victoria, and at times venues in other cities. Another reason Ketchum was able to attract top shows to Toledo was the city's role as a central rail hub. Back in the age of rail travel, Toledo was a convenient stopover for acts on their way to Chicago or points further west. This, along with the Valentine's luxurious reputation, combined to bring all the greats to Toledo. Many of the greatest acts are immortalized on the Valentine's modern day Grand Lobby wall thanks to the leadership of Susan Reams and Mary Wolfe, two longtime supporters of arts in Toledo. We were tasked with putting some artwork here. What on earth do you put in this lobby, the way that it's designed and so forth? We then went to an artist's open house, and he had this fabulous, wonderful mural that he was selling to a bakery in Columbus, Ohio. Mary and I looked at each other, and we both said at the same time, wouldn't this be great? And that's it. So we had no idea how big it was going to be, nor did Paul. He had to research every single one of these people and research their costumes and all about their personalities. And uh, I mean, just imagine the creative juices uh, to do something like this. This is now the largest mural in the city of Toledo, and we are so proud of it. And then, uh, unbeknownst to us, he did put Mary's and my caricature in the painting and we didn't know he was going to we we didn't plan on this but there I am saying Paul now Paul we've got to get this show on the road here when are you going to be finished so what did he do it sort of speaks for itself doesn't it over the course of its first two decades the Valentine Theater brought to Toledo an impressive array of theatrical and musical talent all of the most famous stars of the period played the Valentine most several times during the legitimate theater period. Sarah Bernhardt, Julia Marlowe, Maude Adams, Mrs. Fisk, and John Drew all played the Valentine. Four Barrymores of two generations played here, as did George M. Cohen, ballerina Anna Pavlova, and tenor Enrico Caruso. When John Philip Sousa came to town, he played the Valentine. Great orators graced the stage as well, including Mark Twain, Helen Keller, and the great freethinker Robert Engersoll. By the early years of the 20th century, the Valentine opened its stage to less traditional acts. Harry Houdini played there in 1906, and an exhibition basketball game was held on its stage in 1912. The underdog Toledo Overlands beat the Detroit Athletics 47 to 37. I think the, the one that's most fun would be, uh, would be Harry Houdini, who's pictured in the mural hanging upside down with chains all over him. He challenged the Burdan Company, which was a very large uh, shipping company, to construct a box that they would put him in and throw him off the Cherry Street Bridge. And uh, they took up the challenge, put him in there, and uh, he attracted thousands of people to the riverfront, which was quite something because the riverfront used to be the big industry with railroads and heavy equipment and all kinds of things on it. 
It took him like three or four minutes to bob to the surface. So uh, yeah, he was, he was something. At its peak, the Valentine symbolized the golden age of Toledo. It housed one of the city's best restaurants, including Oyster Ocean and Patterson's, later known as the Valentine Cafe, a basement establishment that offered diners their choice of decor in private Dutch, Oriental, Venetian, Colonial, or German dining rooms. It was the society place to go for squab on casserole, mutton chops, saute caribou, or filet mignon. In 1913, as the city boomed with the automobile and glass industries, a massive illuminated sign, 78 feet long and 68 feet high, bearing 7,000 lights and weighing 25 tons, was hoisted into place on the roof of the Valentine. The animated sign could be seen for miles flashing its claim, you will do better in Toledo. The St. Clair and Adams Street facades of the building were designed for retail on the first floor and office space above. During downtown's retail peak, Adams Street was the busiest and most important corridor. Today's LaSalle's apartment building was the LaSalle department store. The Lion Store occupied the St. Clair Adams block where the HCR Manor Care building is now. A block further on Summit, where Imagination Station now stands, was the legendary Titkeys. The upper floors of the St. Clair and Adams building fronts were designed as an office building. In 1936, the office portion of the building was converted into the Willard Hotel, operated by the Commodore Perry Hotel Company. There are rooms in the basement where people uh, anecdotally uh, say there were, was gambling and, and, and stuff like that going on. Um, we know that there was a lot of that activity downtown uh, during uh, Prohibition. There's one room down there that uh, has uh, L-shaped holders to put a large wooden board in to keep people from getting in. There was also access to the uh, tunnel system downtown. The tunnel system was installed for utilities and to run steam to the buildings from the steam plant in Promenade Park. There are stories about how people would get from the speakeasy areas into these tunnels to evade the police. St. Clair Street was the most important corridor for theaters. Across St. Clair, where the Four Seagate building is now, were the Palace and Rivoli theaters. South a block was the Pantheon, and south another block was the Vitaphone, where the first talkie was presented in Toledo in 1928. St. Clair once connected with the Cherry Summit intersection. Here was located the People's Theater, later known as the Town Hall. This was the heart of where everybody came to be a part of Toledo's nightlife. And so you had, you know, restaurants and taverns and bars and hotels and everything people would want just within a two block area. This whole strip along St. Clair was called the Great White Way because there were so many theaters lit up at night with white light bulbs that it was like daytime. And that really solidified, you know, the, the city, the downtown, as the entertainment district. You can just imagine, you know, I've seen pictures of it, uh, walking down the, the Great White Way, it was just brilliant, it's like daytime. Although the grand opening of the Valentine was touted as a great dramatic event, George Ketchum had the misfortune of completing his building on the eve of the depression of the 1890s, when property values stagnated and money was tight. Though Toledo's booming industrial market helped the community survive the economic downturn better than most cities in this period, it must still have been quite a windfall for Ketchum when the Toledo City Council leased most of the theater complex's second and third floors for city offices. Ketchum was certainly grateful. After the first council meetings held in the new building, Ketchum invited all the politicos upstairs, where the city's engineer's offices had been turned into a lavish banquet room, and the night was filled with feasting and merrymaking. One reporter noted that the right royal knight made temporary friends of enemies. Councilmen who seemed ready to fight while down on the floor below clinked glasses in good fellowship and never hesitated to tell each other what great men they were.
George Ketchum's remarkable creation eventually housed the offices of Toledo's most famous politicians, Samuel, Golden Rule Jones, and Brand Whitlock, reformers who protested that the city's taxes were being drained away in the form of rent to one of the city's richest men. But neither Jones nor Whitlock was ever able to convince a majority of the council to invest in a city hall, and the Valentine Building would remain the seat of the city's government until 1929, when rents that grew past $20,000 forced a hasty move to the newly completed Safety Building, a structure intended to serve as the headquarters for the Toledo Police Department. As tastes in technology and entertainment changed, so did the Valentine Theater. The zenith of American touring theater was ending just as vaudeville came into its own, followed closely by motion pictures. Vaudeville consisted of a series of variety presentations where anything from dancers to singers to comedians would form a playbill that could go on for hours. The Lowe's Company was, at that time, one of several vaudeville circuits. In 1917, Lowe's bought the Valentine Company and assumed control of its theaters, including the Valentine. At the time of the Lowe's takeover of the theater operation, Scott Properties, a holding company of the Edward Drummond and Florence Scott Libby estate, acquired the Valentine Building. The Libbies founded the Toledo Museum of Art and their estate supported the museum after their passing. Earnings from Scott Properties went to the Toledo Museum of Art. As part of the Lowe's takeover, a screen was stretched across the stage in 1918 and the Valentine began to double as a movie house. Movies soon took over the Valentine and vaudeville died out over time. Those 30 feet of sheeting signaled the end of the theater's glory as a live performing arts venue. With the Great Depression came the demise of many touring companies as the public's escapist mania for the talkies took over the entertainment industry. Vaudeville itself was developed to be a family-friendly kind of thing where the, you know, the jokes were clean and the acts weren't uh, ribald or, or, or anything like that. And it became very, very popular. In 1917, Lowe's bought the theater operation. At the time, they, Lowe's was a vaudeville circuit, but they were becoming very interested in movies. A lot of the people who had been vaudevillians basically played their acts in movies and so people could see them filmed rather than uh, maybe lesser or less known people on the vaudeville circuit. The movies basically took over. The Valentine became Lowe's premier movie palace in Toledo and one of the first Lowe's movie houses in the country. As the movie craze took over, downtown Toledo saw the introduction of several other movie houses. One in particular would cast a heavy shadow over George Ketchum's handsome little theater. Located on the corner of Adams and Huron Streets, the Paramount Theater opened on February 16, 1929 with Richard Dix in Redskin. Simply put, it was mammoth in size and stunning in its beauty and amenities. Designed in French Renaissance atmospheric style, it featured massive ornate lobbies, luxurious wallpaper and carpets, gilded mirrors, chandeliers, and an atmospheric ceiling that could display twinkling stars and clouds. It was one of only a handful of atmospheric style theaters designed by the nationally known Chicago-based architectural firm, Rap and Rap. Seating was provided for approximately 1,600 in the orchestra, 400 in the mezzanine, and 1,400 in the balcony. It was equipped with a three-manual Wurlitzer pipe organ. As a result, the Valentine was no longer Toledo's premier theater. As some of the original luster wore off the Valentine with the departure of City Hall to the Safety Building and the opening of the Paramount in 1929, the Valentine suffered through the Depression era as much of the country did. But the theater did experience a few bright spots. Despite economic tragedy that hit Toledo particularly hard, Lowe's undertook a major redecoration in 1932. The box office was moved from the St. Clair vestibule to the street, restrooms were moved from the far end of the lobby to the lower level. The entire theater was refurbished from top to bottom. Decorations were plush and richer than the original Victorian details, the seats were replaced and all electric, sound and projection equipment was updated. 
The 1932 redecoration was notable because the 10-week update was accomplished between the hours of 11 p.m. and 11 a.m. There was no cessation of film performance. Scaffolding was removed every morning and replaced each night. Also well noted was the concern with jobs. Local workers were used exclusively and materials were purchased from local sources. 2,000 yards of carpet came from LaSalle's department store. Usher's uniforms were selected to match the new decor. In 1936, much of the office portion of the building was converted into the Willard Hotel, operated by the Commodore Perry. As the Great Depression loosened its grip, the American public embraced the downtown movie houses in droves as Hollywood released blockbuster movies that premiered at the Valentine, including Gone with the Wind in January of 1940. But the good times were not without their troubles, as the Valentine would be locked in a battle for Toledo's entertainment dollar with the paramount for what appeared to be years to come. World War II did not interrupt the competition between the Valentine and the Paramount. To keep up with the size of the Paramount, Lowe's determined that the seating capacity of the Valentine had to be increased. Despite wartime shortages, the theater was closed for a major renovation in 1942. Ironically, Rapp & Rapp, the same firm that designed the Paramount Theater, was engaged by Lowe's to reconstruct the Valentine. The plan was to remove the venerable stage to make way for additional seating. To accomplish this, the building was completely retrofitted. Most of the interior was gutted to the bare brick walls. Gone were the Victorian interior details, the great proscenium arch, the chandeliers, cherubs, urns, and marble columns. The only significant interior detail that was not gutted or covered was the Victorian staircase in the lobby. The interior was fitted with a then popular Chinese modern design. Sleek and sophisticated, the new walls and ceilings were painted jade green, a color most would call hospital green today. Some people lament that most of the old Victorian detail was pulled out, but that is probably why this theater is still here and none of the other ones are, because it was showing movies uh, well into the 70s. It was sort of derivative of Art Deco, but with a more of a 40s twist, probably to differentiate it from the, the Paramount and make it quite different and quite sleek. Downstairs in the lower lobby where the restrooms are, there's a, a mural and some light fixtures and, and a couch. Yeah, there, there is a nod to that. Lowe's biggest reason to redo the theaters, they wanted more seats. By removing the proscenium and the stage and extending the auditorium down into the pit, capacity was increased to almost 2,000. The movie screen was hung on the back wall of the former stage house. The 1942 reconstruction of the interior was billed as the equivalent of the opening of a brand new facility. Selected for the first film was the world premiere of Stand By for Action, a patriotic naval epic starring Robert Taylor, Brian Donlevy, and Charles Lawton. Sailors from the Bayview Naval Training Station participated in the festivities and the Navy Glee Club performed. A Blade article gushed that the alterations represented an achievement in total transformation and style. Admission to the premiere was the purchase of a war bond. Also, during World War II, the local USO was headquartered in the restaurant club space on the basement level of the Adam Street side of the Valentine Complex. This space was called the Chevron Room, and during the big band era, it featured both local and national acts. The Fanny Farmer's store on the street level at the Adams St. Clair corner employed a teenage Teresa Brewer, the pop singer who went on to record the hit Music, Music, Music. Legend has it that a Chevron room impresario discovered her in the candy store and, as they say, the rest is history. By the end of World War II, the Lowe's Valentine and the Paramount experienced a huge surge in business as GIs arrived home and movies became not only a national obsession, but also an insatiable passion. Theater owners clamored for new films each week, and Hollywood considered itself invulnerable. As the golden era of Hollywood blossomed, the battle between the Lowe's Valentine and the Paramount raged on. To everyone's surprise, the skirmish between the Valentine and Paramount was short-lived. 
The tide of American consumerism, which had propelled the movie palaces to prestige and profitability, contributed to their decline by the 1950s. By then, a chicken in every pot morphed into a car in every driveway and a television in every living room. Americans' pursuit of the material good life led them to a suburban exodus. Suburbanization, fueled by affordable automobiles and cheap gas, and the lifestyle they called for spelled doom for downtown movie palaces. Suburbanization after World War II really did affect Toledo, and, and due to a number of factors, what one of is ease of transportation. You know, a lot of people had cars, the roads were being improved. Um, you also have the baby boom. Right, a lot of people coming back from the war, uh, getting married, having families. Land begins to be developed all around the city. The eventual outcome of that, of course, was that the major stores at the time, Lion Store, LaSalle's, started to move out into the suburbs to open a, an anchor store in one of these new malls. Consequently, the downtown stores begin to suffer because they, they're no longer the only game in town. Television played a role as well. Between 1947 and 1957, 90% of American households acquired a television. Newsreels were a thing of the past by the early 50s. TV news broadcasts meant people could get the same information without leaving their home. Theater owners tried various gimmicks to entice customers away from their TV sets, including widescreen, Cinerama, and 3D motion pictures, all of which meant the renovation of existing theaters to accommodate a wider screen. By the 1960s, motion pictures alone couldn't fill the seats of the Valentine Theater anymore. And Lowe's moved on in 1962. But the Valentine held on when the Armstrong Circuit, based in Bowling Green, took over and continued to operate it as a movie house, albeit on a smaller scale. The Paramount was not so lucky. Its huge size had always worked against it. Although many other 1920s movie palaces survived in other cities, they seated fewer than 3,000, even in much larger markets than Toledo. Even though longtime Toledoans deeply lamented its demise, the huge theater was never profitable. In fact, its original tenant, the Publix chain, did not renew its lease when it expired after 20 years. It operated as an independent till the early 1960s when it finally closed. Sadly, this impressive monument to a bygone era sat vacant for a few years before it was demolished in 1965 to make way for a parking lot. Though the Valentine had won the war with the Paramount, it had little to show for its success. The theater struggled to find its niche in a rapidly changing world. After Lowe's abandoned the Valentine, it operated as a first-run independent for 10 more years. Although its screen was expanded to Cinemax size, and it was the Toledo area's first home to the popular film, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World in 1963, things spiraled downhill quickly. In 1972, new owners began showing second-run movies for a dollar. This lasted until 1975. During 1976, a new operator attempted to revive the movie house, bringing back Gone with the Wind and other classics. There were even some rock concerts in the theater, and Toledo's public television station, WGTE, moved in and made itself at home. In the end, nothing took hold, and the fate of the Valentine sank deeper in doubt. In 1977, the city of Toledo bought the building it had occupied as a tenant years before, for $468,000 in a foreclosure sale. The city planned to use the building for temporary office space, renaming it the Renaissance Building. But, as fate would have it, the Renaissance was short-lived. The state of Ohio soon announced the planned construction of one government center, and the city no longer needed the Valentine for office space. By the end of the decade, just 85 years since its grand opening as George Ketchum's dream, it seemed the Valentine Theater was set for the same fate as its old rival, the Paramount. Several groups took a look at the building, including the local Arts Commission. In the end, everyone took a pass at the daunting task of bringing Ketchum's dream back to life. The 1980s were particularly hard on Toledo. Each of its seven Fortune 500 companies was permanently compromised by takeovers or attempts. 
Several large companies that had provided jobs and support to the community moved or ceased to exist. The companies that weathered the storm remained in reduced circumstances. Retail's last gasp left downtown for the suburbs as the Lion Store and LaSalle's both closed. Once Toledo's retail jewel, Adam Street was deserted. The riverfront Seagate complex was just being launched and the Valentine block was eyed for parking for the four Seagate building projected across St. Clair Street. After WGTE left to take over WSPD's old space on Huron, the Valentine building itself was without heat after the closing of the Edison steam plant and needed major repair work, particularly for its leaking roof. After the heat was turned off, water would leak in and freeze inside the building. In August of 1983, a task force established by Mayor Doug DeGood recommended the demolition of the Valentine as soon as possible, at a cost nearly equal to the original cost of building the building. There was, there was a bias of the times was against old. Anything old was bad. Um, and you could tear it down. You could tear down social problems. If, if they wanted to save old buildings, they were romantics, but uh, they weren't living in the real world. And there was the presumption that it was more expensive to renovate an old building than to build something new. It seemed that this was to be the final blow to Toledo's last connection with the golden age of traveling theater. But something had happened years earlier that lit a fire under a few spirited Valentine supporters. Ironically, it was the demolition of the Valentine's rival, the Paramount Theater. Many Toledoans resented the destruction of downtown buildings for more surface parking lots. There was a group of people that rallied uh, around it called Friends of the Valentine, and a lot of people got very excited suddenly realizing this is the last theater. It absolutely became a rallying cry, there's no doubt about it, because at that time most of the people that were involved with the Friends group remembered having gone to the Valentine or to the Paramount, and so they realized the importance of that. A group of Toledo citizens with the general welfare of their city and its future in mind began developing a master plan which would retain all the good and eliminate all the bad and make Toledo an ideal city of efficiency and beauty. Toledo was late and sluggish to join the preservation bandwagon. Paul Block Jr., then publisher of The Blade, was anti-preservation and in fact once published an editorial entitled Hysteric Preservation. In his eyes, the small, hardy band of Old West End urban pioneers were considered extreme, and preservation in the downtown commercial district just did not exist. It was during this crucial period that new factors came together to provide a small, dim ray of hope for the building. A group of performing arts leaders determined that there was a need in the area for a performing arts center and interest in locating such a venue downtown. As the Seagate development progressed, the Portside Marketplace opened with new downtown retail that brightened hopes for a time. At the Blade, a new generation of blocks took over. John Robinson Block, son of Paul Block Jr., had spent some of his formative years in London, where he was struck by the economic vitality the theater district provided and by the viability of preservation. Through his leadership, a downtown preservation movement was launched. A city uh, bureaucrat led a committee and they wrote a report that said that the Renaissance building couldn't be saved and needed to be torn down. And that's when I entered the picture. My father had become sick. Um, I returned to the Blade. I had no official job, no title, but I began to um, bend my father's ear that we had to do something to save the, the Valentine Theater. When my father was a sophomore in college, he enrolled in a class taught by a famous professor in the Yale English department named John Burdan. Burdan had been a direct descendant of the first mayor of Toledo who was named Burdan. And one of the things my father remembered Professor Burdan telling him was about how Professor Burdan had been in attendance on that first night at the Valentine Theater and many years later when I needed 
the Blade editorial position to change, at least make an exception in towards historic preservation of old building. I had to get my father's support. I, I'll always believe that my father, remembering Burdan, telling him about opening night, and that first meeting as an impressionable sophomore in college with Professor Burdan had something to do with it. By 1985, the Save the Valentine campaign was begun by the performing arts group and preservationists calling themselves Friends of the Valentine. Buttons were sold, fundraisers were held, and restoration studies were completed. The Friends of the Valentine joined the Toledo Cultural Arts Center and their first victory was to convince Toledo City Council to allow them to shore up the building and mothball it while they raised the money to restore it completely. By that time, uh, the whole building complex here was not one that had any any use. In fact, the city was talking about tearing it down. There is no question that it was the grassroots movement that got saved this theater. Everybody wanted the Performing Arts Center. And the people that were the early people that then went on the board of Toledo Cultural Arts Center, there was a real concerted effort again to look for a building downtown that would be convertible to that purpose, and this is the one they settled on. The first push was to fund the roof repair and arrest the problem of water damage. Finally, the roof was secured in 1988. The steam plant had been disconnected by that time, which meant all the downtown buildings had to restore their own heating systems individually. It had virtually no light, and nothing else in it worked. There were no toilets, no. <laughs> water, you talk about anything. There were a few light bulbs on the marquee, which we were going to tear down anyway, because it was like the fourth or the one, fifth one. It wasn't the one that was going to be kept. The building basically had been shut down. It was basically still. The ensuing drive to complete the restoration involved many more years of backbreaking work and steely resolve. The fundraising side of it is really a matter of having a great story, telling the story, and telling everybody about the historic significance of the Valentine, why it was important to save the Valentine, what it meant to our community. And to very seldom did we get turned down by, by anybody. I mean, everybody I think in this community loves Toledo and they understand the historic significance of the Valentine. Fundraising structure uh, was uh, headed by Jim White. We had uh, three um, divisions uh, that uh, focused on the fundraising. We had corporate community, and uh, Woody Morcott uh, chaired that. We had uh, uh, another division that Bob Oshbach chaired, and those were uh, gifts of uh, 10,000 to 100,000, basically. And then we had a grassroots uh, campaign that was headed by Harry Kessler and Sandy Eisenberg. And that was primarily a mail campaign uh, so that individuals could contribute $25, $100, $1,000. And I think this was a very significant time when everybody really did come together. We got a good cross-section of the community to, to raise the money, to be involved. Uh, we have volunteers. I mean, this is like a home for a lot of people. After the roof was repaired in 1988, the Toledo Cultural Arts Center worked long and hard to effect the restoration. Funding was an ongoing problem. The first break came in 1993, when National Church Residences agreed to convert the old Willard Hotel portion of the building into 54 senior apartments. The Renaissance Apartments were the first residential conversion downtown and helped to make the entire project financially feasible. The same year brought funds for the demolition of many of the 1942 Chinese modern alterations that had obliterated the stage and proscenium. Finally, in 1996, the state of Ohio committed $9.5 million of the $15 million proposed for renovation, and real progress began. It's uh, down in Columbus a lot, um, probably uh, several times a month meeting with uh, the Northwest uh, delegation of representatives to the, the state and the Senate and the Congress. The, the grant funding was given to us in three phases over three biennials. So we were able to do certain things on each section with each grant. So phase one was basically just demolition and removal of hazardous material. And phase two, 
We were able to uh, put together the architectural, finish the architectural drawing, go out to bed, and those types of things. And uh, we finally got the, the final funding, the full funding, which allowed us, once we raised, uh, had the match, to proceed with the project. Further delays and escalating costs of building material pushed the renovation tab up. The state eventually committed $18.5 million to the project. I was very concerned about the ongoing operations of the theater. As we looked at theaters across the country, virtually none of them were able to support themselves just based on uh, ticket sales and rental. So we were able to establish a foundation which the state accepted as matching funds. As far as I know, it's the only time that's ever been done for an arts project, so that's allowed Valentine Theater to run positive cash flow for 20 years. The city and the county committed about $2 million and $5.4 million was raised privately to fulfill a new state mandate for an operating endowment. The official groundbreaking was held in April 1998. The groundbreaking time comes. All the dignitaries arrive, including Governor Taft, who of course obviously helped us get the money. Well, we didn't really want to bring them through the hole in the wall, which had a dirt ramp. So we built a kind of a pair of steps where, which were okay, but they were a little rickety. So we all ended down on this kind of dirt floor, and we decided to kind of go with the flow on this one. We took pieces of brick that had been excavated, we had them painted, put our V on it, and we put the date of our groundbreaking. So I think that all went together kind of nicely. An aggressive 17-month construction period followed and transformed the building into a state-of-the-art performance venue. Surprises in the renovation were routine. Mechanical systems still existed from 1895, and the major 1932 and 1942 mechanical updates were intertwined with them like spider webs. Brick walls were found to be collapsing from within. The Victorian ceiling at the top of the historic lobby was rediscovered and its renovation incorporated into the financial package. Finally, in a furious last-minute frenzy, the theater opened on October 9, 1999, with the first gala celebration. 10,000 people toured the building the next day. The first production was the Toledo Opera's Tosca on October 29, 1999. Today, after a 21-year effort by the Toledo Cultural Arts Center Board of Trustees and many members of the Toledo community, over one million people have attended hundreds of international, national, and local presentations. The theater has been used by more than 50 community groups, including the Toledo Opera, Toledo Ballet, Ballet Theater of Toledo, the Toledo Symphony, Toledo Jazz Orchestra, Masterworks Chorale, University of Toledo, and many others. From a legend about the deed being won in a card game, to a rivalry with the Paramount Theater, and surviving a mayor set on demolishing it, this Toledo theater holds many little-known stories in its walls. The world has transformed in many ways, but the Valentine Theater stands as a testament to the golden era of Toledo, and what can happen when a community bands together to save a historic treasure. This is Toledo Stories, Encore, the story of the Valentine Theater. Encore, the story of the Valentine Theater is made possible by the generous support of Key Bank, supporting its communities through charitable sponsorships to arts, civic, education, and health and human services groups. Also through the support of Block Communications Incorporated and by the following, Ronald and Diane Bell Jr., Finley Davies Incorporated, Alan and Suzanne Libby, Mark and Gretchen Zindorf, and by viewers like you. Thank you. We used to go, my buddies and I was in high school, we used to go to Ann Arbor to football games. And that was back when you, you could walk in, you know, you didn't have to have a, you could pay for a dollar, sit in the end zone. And on the way back, we'd come back, this is before Interstate 23 was, was up, 
back the back roads, it was through farmland. And we would stop, there'd be chickens out on the road and stuff, we'd stop and grab a chicken and put it in the trunk. And a couple of times we came down here under our coats with the chickens and dropped the chickens off in the balcony. And of course the, the, the projection would come down across your shoulder, you'd throw the things up in the air and you'd see this chicken flying through the air and then we'd run like the devil to get out of here, come down to here and go right out. Okay, go ahead, I'm <laughs> sorry, just a little digression. Uh, I absolutely have a favorite memory, um, and, and it's a very personal one. When the movie El Greco premiered, Mel Farrar was the star, and it premiered in Toledo because of, you know, El Greco and Toledo and Toledo, we were sister cities. So he premiered the movie here at the Valentine, and at the time I was in high school, I was in the glee club at Central Catholic High School, and we were asked to sing at the opening performance. So I remember distinctly being on stage, I, I don't remember what we sang, but you know, something probably with a Spanish theme. Um, and, and that's an incredible memory because we met the star of the show and then we were invited out to the Park Lane Hotel for a reception. and. That, that's a wonderful memory. We had a little problem, there's always a problem coordinating when you have, you know, like 32 subs and six primes and whatever, all these people we had, trying to get people to get you things on time. I had a heating, I, but I had heat in the building, but I don't have, didn't have a roof. So one night we had a big rain, and the next day when we came in, we had a very interesting sort of water show going on. The water was running down the old, the, the, the wall between the Grand Lobby and here, which is the old historic wall that was in the, uh, in, in the alley, that went along the alley. It was running down that wall, and it was also coming down the Grand Staircase. 